Hello and welcome to this podcast from the Private Wealth Team at Safri. My name is Leonora Stevens. I'm a partner in the Private Wealth Team based in Bristol. I'm delighted to be joined virtually by Mike Hodges, a fellow Private Wealth Partner at Safri. He's based in our Manchester office. Hello, Mike. Hi, Leo. Today we are talking about weddings and civil partnerships and the associated tax considerations. I had rather hoped that Mike and I could be doing this recording in an office together whilst clinking our glasses and drinking a glass of fizz to really get into the spirit of the wedding season. But instead, sadly, we could just visualise this whilst we drink our coffees in our Safri's branded mugs. I might just do a little clink. There we go. Joking aside. Nice water, Leo. Yeah. (laughs) Joking aside, the summer does tend to be the busy season for weddings and civil partnerships. Whilst it's always a happy time for many, or hopefully the bride and groom, there are tax matters to consider, whether it's related to gifts, for example, a parent may want to make a gift to their child, or the implications of getting married on the bride and groom and their tax position. I would say that the um, the tax implications of getting married are the same, whether it be for a, a marriage or a civil partnership. So anything we cover here will apply to both um, situations. So in this podcast, we will cover off the key tax points to keep in mind, including the various benefits of getting hitched. So, Mike, as people love a gift, in particular on marriage right. or civil partnership, do you want to summarise the gifting rules and any things that we should, you know, relating to inheritance tax or CGT that people should keep in mind? Yeah, absolutely. And just just as a word, because it was on iPlayer, my preparation for this over the last couple of evenings before I go, went to bed was what, re-watching, re-re-watching Four Weddings and a Funeral, which I still oh. love. That's kind of my, <laughs> my thing. Um I'm an old softy, really. Some of your research, Leo, you you said that the average age of a married couple in the 1970 was 23, and it's now increased to 31. And I thought, well, crikey, my wedding anniversary was a couple of weeks ago. I was 25 in 1987 when mm-hmm. I got married. Uh, my wife was a year younger. So those of you who are quick with the mental math can work out how old I am. But there you well, go. Look, my parents got married in the 70s, and they were 23, and I got married at 34. So yeah. There you go. It's just it's just the way it goes, isn't it? Like these these trends, but it does bring in the more because we're talking about older spouses and therefore older parents. That there is an exemption for gift for inheritance tax purposes, so you can ignore if you fall within this exemption the idea of a, a normal gift with no wedding in prospect and having to survive seven years. It's just an exemption, and it's a gift in consideration of marriage. And I'll come back to that in a second. And it's. For a child, five thousand pounds, or a grandchild, two and a half thousand pounds, or a thousand pounds for any other person, and in consideration of marriage, felt like such an old-fashioned phrase. I went down one of these googling uh, wormholes, and well, actually through one of our tax resources, so pro- rather than proper Google, and you've got two pages of legislation, and then a reference because it felt just feels so old-fashioned to a 1963 House of Lords case, which refers back to the 1910 Finance Act. So it's all it's all got good heritage. And, and I suppose there's still some kind of public policy reason to encourage marriage, which is which is nice to see for us traditionalists. That, so that's a specific, I guess, also worth bearing in mind that everyone has the, the £3,000 annual exemption for inheritance tax. And the one that's easiest to forget are the, the gifts out of surplus income, which are just the general IHT reliefs that, that people should be looking to take take advantage of. And I guess the other thing to flag is that, I guess conceptually, your gift could be anything. But if you are having to sell an asset to give you the funds to, to make your gift, whether it's a cash gift or you buy something else, then that sale is potentially a capital gains tax event and with the annual capital gains tax exemption having been slashed over the last couple of years that could become more in point but um, so some encouragement from government for for marriage which is good to see as i say so we've got our married couple down the aisle leo so what are the tax benefits for them when they have tied the knot well, one of the, the the main ones that people talk about is from a capital gains perspective, tax perspective. Uh, so it's the no gain, no loss rules. And so if prior to a marriage and you were to give an asset to your partner, then you would be subject to tax on any gain on the asset based on the market value of that asset at the time. Um, even if you haven't received any any cash for it, which is known as a dry tax charge. However, once you're married, you can transfer assets between each other, no gain, no loss, 
and there'd be no tax on this transfer. But you might say, why do I care? Why does it matter? Well, there are various reasons and you can you can be quite smart with it. So, for example, you might have a couple where one is a high earner and the other spouse is a basic rate taxpayer or may not have any income sources. Um, if the higher earner transfers some of their investments that are standing at a gain to the other spouse, then they could potentially, if, if the lower earner sold those and realised a gain, then they'd pay tax at a lower rate, potentially 10% instead of 20 So actually, there's, you could save 10% of tax, which is always useful. Um, I think with all these things, all the little things can add up to big things if you make yeah. them up all these sort of release and allowances. Again, you can have the same with a loss. So so one might be sitting on some investments which are standing at a loss, whereas the other one might have things that are standing again, but they can't they can't sell them yet or they can't transfer them. And so you can transfer the investment standing at a loss to the other partner. That's all no gain, no loss. And you can just move things around, which is quite an effective way of sort of reducing your overall tax position as a your effective yeah. rate of tax between you. I would also say that we obviously are not providing investment advice in what we say here. And so you should think about this from an inspe- investment perspective, not necessarily from the tax. But I so say that I think the no gain, no loss point is quite key when people are talking about one of the benefits of yeah. marriage. But I think, Mike, you had an interesting story about how the no gain, no loss transfers can interact with other planning, for example, relating to company shares. This, this was my slightly tongue-in-cheek example, wasn't it? Which many, many, many years I did talk to two guys about. They, they owned a company 85%, 15%. And it's so common that people don't get their shareholding sorted out. Well, as a whole so, separate subject. And they were saying it's 85, 15, but long ago we, we had agreed it should have been 50, 50. But that was going to have tax consequences of, of just transferring the, to 35%. So I did suggest to them, well, you could divorce your existing wives, each remarry the other's wife or marry the other's wife, make the transfer of shares whilst married, then I suppose conceptually divorce and remarry your original wife, which is all a heck of a long way round. I can't remember how much tax was involved at the time and I wasn't saying it seriously, but in principle, you could look at things like that. I'm sure nowadays... There'd be some kind of revenue, overall anti-avoidance, anti-abuse, something or other that would catch that. But it does demonstrate the power, of, which we take for granted as tax practitioners, I think, of just transferring between spouses without having to think about it, which is is great. And coming back to that shareholding point, getting yourself sorted long in advance and when you should and not putting it off until too late in the day and you've got tax issues coming up. I think in particular, though, with something that you said before is about business asset disposal relief is where, say, you had, let's just say, man A and man B, yeah. both had 50-50 and they both were married. They could transfer some of their shares, no gain, no loss to their spouse. Their spouse could be an employee or officer of the business yes. for the minimum period of time. And therefore, they can then benefit from their business asset disposal relief yeah. allowance yeah. of a million pounds each, which, again, is is a very good um, and as a horror story on that, I did, completely separate from the, my facetious example, come across a business owned by four individuals, two two sets of spouses, and they've managed, I can't remember how they've done it now, to get to a point where none of them qualified. This would this was for old-fashioned entrepreneurs. Really. Somehow, before before we came on the scene, they managed to mess it all up. So please, please, please ask in advance. Yes. I think there was a point when the revenue were looking to every business asset disposal relief claim yes um, yeah you know specifically making sure that the criteria was being met yeah so that's to say that's something that we that you really need to make sure you've got professional yeah. advice on yeah yeah definitely in good time and and also sort of covering off the no gain no loss point what about the um the principal residence rules well i guess you know we've talked about the, the benefits of being able to transfer assets tax-free this is one of the disadvantages that if you've got a couple getting married then as a married couple, they will only have one main residence. So their situation is changing. If you've got two two individuals with their own properties coming into a marriage, going into that, they're only going to have one main residence. So I suppose you could either sell one of the properties, the one you're not going to occupy, or if you're going to do what a lot of people do, keep it, rent it out. You're going to have to acknowledge that beyond the point where you get married, it's going to cease qualifying. So the, the capital gains computation will 
will start to become relevant and you'll start to see an increase in the tax. Um, so just something to think about. Yeah. Don't want to spoil a happy day by saying, right, you need to worry about all these tax things. But um, but but some some common sense thought about it just before you you commit. And equally, equally on a on a positive note, Leo, you wanted to say something about wills and and death. We, we're introducing that to. Well, it, it, indeed, I mean, obviously, yeah, it's an important. Uh, getting married is a very happy time, but you should also think about about wills, for example. So, you know, in in most cases, when you upon marriage, you need to redraft your will. Yeah. Um, you might also, if you've done a will before marriage, your wishes may change. So, actually, you might think. Obviously, now I'd like to leave everything to my wife, or maybe they wouldn't, or husband. So again, you, you need to think mm. about and, and it, put some planning in place. The other thing also is to think about one of the benefits of being married is is from an IHT perspective. So un, under the current rules, you can leave everything to your surviving spouse with no inheritance tax, which is which is great. And one one of the other benefits is the market rate uplift. So what this means is, so if I give an example where. Let's say the wife owns an investment property which she bought for a hundred thousand pounds and it's now worth a million. If she were to have sold that, she'd have paid capital gains tax up to twenty four percent on the gain of nine hundred thousand. But if she left it to her husband instead on death, he'd receive it at the market rate. So their base cost would then be that million pounds. So then they could soon after the death, if they didn't want the property, they could then sell and there'd be no CGT. So that sort of market rate uplift effectively wipes out the gain i mean looking at a lot of my clients they own property mainly 50 50 anyway yeah, um, yeah. so you can do some there is there are cases where you can do deathbed planning where you can sort of transfer things across which is useful but we one doesn't always have have time on their side in order to do that no no um so yeah so that, that's another potential benefit of, uh, of being married <laughs> <laughs> a long term when you hope exactly yeah yeah. And there's one point I was just going to lob into that, what, which, which is another slightly obscure one, that there is no definition of marriage for inheritance size purposes, which, which means a couple of things that you can be married, but have been separated for many years, and you would still get the spouse exemption for inheritance tax purposes. And the other one, which again is a bit of a delve through the internet, which is very dangerous for me, because I can get just distracted for hours and hours and hours is that for inheritance tax purposes, you can, it accepts, we accept valid polygamous marriages, which then have me Googling which countries are the, that you can have a valid polygamous marriage, because most of you can't, but the World Population Review tells me that the Solomon Islands, India, Malaysia, the Philippines and Singapore for Muslim couples recognise, well, I suppose couples is the wrong word, parties recognizes polygamous marriages so uh for inheritance tax you could that could be that could really in, increase the scope of your planning couldn't it go to well, a, foreign, a qualifying foreign country enter into a polygamous marriage and then you've got all sorts of choices about where you pass your assets free of inheritance tax your wife must be slightly concerned about your search history <laughs> on google when she so she turns on the family computer to find to I find, find out the history. yeah I go, google google all these things now it's <laughs> it's it's just, I just find it end, endlessly bizarre, the world of tax, and then its application to something as, you know, sort of every day as, as married life. You think that's really obscure. Yeah. The other practical um, point to consider about marriage is on a legal side is the prenups and postnups. And I, I see a lot of my clients actually making it a requirement for their children to sign a prenup yes. before they get married if they want to inherit the future wealth. Yeah, um, and that is becoming more and more common these days. And you know, the, the key with that is that you need to have sufficient time for that. So the other party to the marriage needs to have independent legal advice. They need to have time to consider it, and it needs to be. It can't be a rushed process. Yeah. Um, and then also postnups are another thing that people seem to be talking about a lot. Where, for example, say the parents come into quite a lot of wealth further down the track once the couple are already married. There are conditions in place upon them potentially inheriting that money as long as they sign a post nup. So th those are sort of other things to consider as to how to protect the family wealth. It's not all, doesn't, I don't think it always works, but it's definitely, it's become the norm that yeah. without it, it tends to be lacking really.
and that's where you need your lawyer involved isn't it because that's uh, and that's where we would work with lawyers on those sort of situations yeah exactly yeah yeah great well hopefully um on that optimistic we've depressed uh, everyone haven't we? yeah <laughs> happy marriage day um no i'm sure i'm we wish everyone who's getting married or attending weddings a wonderful time and a long and fruitful marriage um, and um but thank you mike uh, for joining me today we work with a wide range of clients many are uk based and many live overseas but have interests here whether that's property business interests or investments we advise individuals and families on how best to safeguard maintain and enhance their wealth and on the most appropriate methods of passing on that wealth to the next generation we also help people comply with the tax rules in the uk which can be complex if you'd like to find out more about the services we can offer at Safri, please visit our website at www.safri.com. However, it's important for me to stress that if you're considering any of the topics discussed today, you must always take professional advice based on your individual circumstances. Thank you for listening.